New this morning, another weekend curfew just expiring for the Navajo Nation. It's one of the many measures they've taken to help stop the spread of COVID-19. This weekend's curfew was shorter than all the other ones, a sign that the reservation is moving in the right direction. But Navajo leaders say that they are still at a pivotal moment and know this fight is far from over. The Navajo Nation, home to some of our country's most stunning natural landscapes. And just a few months ago, home to a COVID-19 crisis that some said had the power to wipe out this entire community. This pandemic, of course, has affected every single person on our nation, including myself. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez losing two of his relatives to the virus. The pandemic claiming nearly 500 lives here. We are a proud people. We are resilient people. And I know we will overcome this monster. Cases here surging past 9,000. With a population on the reservation of 175,000, President Nez said he and other leaders had to take an aggressive approach to get this pandemic under control. Because of us uh, mandating masks being worn in public in April help reduce the numbers here on the Navajo Nation. Of course, many other factors too. Like an 8 p.m. curfew, extensive contact tracing, and testing more than a third of the population. People here on the Navajo Nation have been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. At one point, they had the highest infection rate in the entire country. Those numbers have started to go down slightly, but leaders here say now is not the time to let up on those safety precautions. We have to keep keep doing what we're doing. But in some places here on the Navajo Nation, those seemingly simple tasks like hand washing aren't as easy as you'd think. Who would have known that within the Navajo Nation, 30 to 40 percent of our Navajo people don't have running water? I don't think nobody would have known if it wasn't for the attention the Navajo Nation received through this pandemic. And at least a third don't have electricity either. It's an infrastructure crisis doctors say directly contributed to the spread of COVID-19. President Nez wants to use part of the $700 million the Navajo Nation received in CARES Act funding to expand utilities on the reservation, but says they'll still need more help from Washington. But we tend to spend billions of dollars to aid other countries in rebuilding war-torn areas, but why not invest right within this country where the first citizens of this country have been pushed aside for way too long. If the federal government can waive laws to get supplies and material to build a wall at the Mexico and U.S. border, why couldn't you waive the laws to improve the quality of life within Indian trust lands. What happens next here, still a mystery. With cases spiking in nearby cities, a possible second wave of COVID-19 here on the reservation and the approaching flu season, President Nez says his people remain on high alert, but is confident that once again, they will rise to meet this challenge. As much as we went through in our history on this planet, on this world, we have been always overcomers. We will overcome this pandemic, and because of that, we will be stronger. Yeah, I just was so impressed by the resilience that I saw in everyone I met there in the Navajo Nation. Now, the hope is to start to reopen some tourist attractions as well. Tomorrow, we're going to take a look at how these closures have really impacted the economy on the Navajo Nation and speak to people who are risking their lives to make ends meet. That's tomorrow right here on ABC 15 Mornings. Time now, 644 on this Tuesday, fighting back against the coronavirus. The Navajo Nation finally gaining the upper hand on this pandemic. They continue to see a big drop in new cases, but the economy hasn't been as quick to recover. World famous Navajo landmarks like Monument Valley remain off limits to tourists right now. Shut down to help leaders here gain the upper hand on this pandemic after having the highest infection rate in the entire country. We want uh, everyone to be healthy. We don't want them to catch the virus. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez says it wasn't an easy decision and knows it's creating more pain for his people. Pain he hopes is only temporary. We had to do some stringent policies by locking down our borders, uh, doing curfews. It has been a challenge for many of our Navajo citizens 
they cannot provide for their families uh, like they used to. We are doing curbside only. We keep uh, a lot of the customers in their vehicles. This is the reality Lyndon Russell is living. He works at a Chinese restaurant in Window Rock. His take home pay cut in half. We shut down for like um, a month and a half, no income. Some of it had to do unemployment. And um, just wondering when's our uh, next paycheck going to come in. And as someone who's working in close contact with customers day in and day out, he knows there's a risk. Does that worry you working here, knowing that you could get sick and then bring it home to your mom? Always, every day. But Lyndon tells us he doesn't have a choice. He needs to work to support his family. That's got to be tough. It is um, a lot. Of, it's a sacrifice you make for your family. And he wasn't the only one. We've really been caught off guard. We've been so sheltered. Nick Taylor manages this shopping center and nine others here on the Navajo Nation. He says nearly a third of his tenants are struggling to pay the bills. Some may not even reopen. It does really become overwhelming and very emotional when you think about it because um, they're just people that have families and living their lives as best they can. Families just like Nick's who have been directly impacted by this pandemic. His uncle losing his battle with the coronavirus. There are those moments when you do kind of hit a low spot, but then you revert back to who you are as an individual along with bringing in traditional custom teachings of being Navajo, Native American, and that really does reinvigorate the soul to continue to push forward and march on, carry on, and be there to support your people. Well, Nick says his company is providing rental assistance to a number of these businesses who've had to shut their doors because of this. He's prepared to do that at least until the end of the year, but doesn't know what's going to happen after that. President Nez tells us he's helping to allocate some of the Navajo Nation's CARES Act funding to help rescue these businesses that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. And tomorrow on ABC 15 Mornings, our series continues. You're going to meet the Navajo doctor returning to her roots to try to save lives on the reservation. Only on ABC 15 morning, she came back to her homeland to serve, always wanting to give back to the people who gave her so much. Right now, we're introducing you to the Navajo Nation doctor who never realized that she would become a silent hero in the fight against the coronavirus. A red cloth waving in the northern Arizona breeze, an ancient symbol for a modern day war. And in the fight against the coronavirus, Dr. Naomi Young is one of the Navajo Nation's fiercest soldiers. Ever since I was young, I've always wanted to be a doctor. It's a calling so strong, it brought Dr. Young back to the Navajo Nation in her hometown, Fort Defiance. The advantage of coming from the reservation and returning to the reservation, I think is a big one because I'm familiar with the socioeconomic uh, disparities that are within the community. Those challenges include limited access to running water, electricity, and healthy food. The Navajo Nation only has a dozen grocery stores to serve an area the size of West Virginia. Some communities have to drive even 30, 40, 50 miles just for a grocery store. And another factor, once seen as an advantage, now credited with claiming more lives. Extended family living together in one house. A part of our Navajo culture and the strength of our culture is the family unit. And we find that in non COVID times, this was our strength, but it's actually one of our weaknesses that we're that we're starting to see all of those factors driving up the coronavirus case numbers. Dr. Young treating dozens of patients since this pandemic began. The marks on her face still visible from the hours and hours she spent wearing a mask. She says it's a small inconvenience and no match for the suffering she's already seen far too many times. Losing a patient to COVID is one of the hardest things that we can take as a physician and it's even harder without the family there because in a way you have to step up as as the local family member. It's that much more pressure that is is kind of put on us. And it's not just the pressure here on the Navajo Nation. When cases spiked in the valley last month, it also meant trouble for the reservation. Could that derail you? Um, yes, it can. And it is a bit of concern, but we track this multiple times a day. Dr. Loretta Christensen is the chief medical officer for the Department of Indian Health Services Navajo office. Hospitals across Arizona and New Mexico have accepted Navajo patients, but so if Phoenix and Albuquerque have no bed capacity, we can't send patients out. We've trained our clinicians, we've gotten ventilators, we have plans to expand our ICUs internally to three times their normal size. 
and we're prepared to do that. Here at Tehuts Hill Medical Center in Fort Defiance, they're doing temperature screenings and asking a series of questions to patients before they're allowed inside just to make sure no one has been exposed to the coronavirus. Dr. Young says it's really been a team effort to get a handle on this pandemic here. The numbers are stabilizing, but she says they're still not where they need to be. We all know it's not over. We all know that this is an endurance game that we're playing. Yeah, it's truly a full circle moment for Dr. Young. She's been at the Hutso Medical Center for four years and says there's nowhere else she'd rather be. Tomorrow on ABC 15 Mornings, we're taking a closer look at some of those infrastructure issues that Dr. Young mentioned, like limited access to running water and how this has had a huge impact on the pandemic with Navajo leaders struggling to get it under control at first. We'll take a deeper dive into that tomorrow morning. It is the year 2020 and there are American citizens going without basic utilities right now. Let that sink in for a second. Things like indoor plumbing, electricity and running water. And it's happening right here in Arizona. Arizona's rocky terrain, even more rugged here on the Navajo Nation. You have to boil it. But that doesn't stop people like Justin Slinky, who've lived here on the reservation their entire lives. I stay up to help myself to, you know, keep keep moving, moving, motivated. Motivated even through intense personal struggle. A decade ago, a car accident nearly paralyzed him. Doctors weren't sure if Justin would ever walk again. He proved them wrong, but now lives with chronic pain. It's just the pain that I've carried from the accident. That nerves mm -hmm. and it, it don't go away. Despite what his body tells him, Justin travels to this water well on the outskirts of Window Rock. It's all so he can fill up these tanks in the back of his truck. Got his picket for him. Because at his house, there is no running water. And if he doesn't make these trips, no matter how much pain he's in, nothing comes out of the faucet. One day they will, will probably have water, I don't know. <laughs> as many as 40% of the people here on the Navajo Nation don't have access to running water. That means they have to come to wells just like this one and fill up their own storage containers. That's basically their only option. And if not, their houses run dry. Justin is actually one of the lucky ones. Despite everything he's been through, he's still able to pick up his own water. But that's not the case for everyone. I've been here all our life. At Jean Big Horse's ranch in Tuba City, she's got almost everything. Backyard views of the Grand Canyon, dozens of sheep, and blue sky as far as the eye can see. But one thing she doesn't have is running water. I get used to it. There's also no indoor plumbing. Instead, Jean and her husband use this outhouse located on their property. Driving down this dirt road is the only way to reach the Big Horse Ranch. Jean and her husband used to travel this way to pick up their own water to store in these tanks for themselves and their sheep, but physically can't do it anymore. Her husband had open heart surgery and now walks with a cane. And Jean says she's now too afraid to make the trip alone. I kind of scared to have the water now. Okay. But thankfully, she doesn't have to anymore. Sadly, when they stay home, they end up falling through the cracks. Zolzani is with the nonprofit Collective Medicine. Their goal is to service people all across the Navajo Nation through their initiative, Water Warriors United. They uh, have a hard time getting drinking water if they live in remote areas. A lot of our aunties don't have uh, pickup trucks. A lot of our elders don't have um, working vehicles even. So far, they've delivered 600 barrels of water, just like this one. It'll last Jean and her husband at least a few weeks. And when it runs out, Zol says he'll be back with more. Right now, um, I am happy. I'm happy that you that do here with the water. For Jean, it's giving her peace of mind, knowing so many people are willing to help. And in her darkest moments, she tells me she can always rely on her faith. What keeps you feeling hopeful through all of this? To pray what you believe in. Gina is so resilient. Doctors say not having running water directly contributed to the spread of COVID-19 on the Navajo Nation. So why is this still a problem? Some people point to the federal government. Some say the tribe should be doing more. But Navajo leaders tell me CARES Act funding will go towards infrastructure upgrades. And if you'd like to help people like Water Warriors United with their mission, we've posted a link so you can do that on ABC15.com.
There is a water crisis on Arizona's tribal lands right now. We've told you how as many as 40% of the people in the Navajo Nation do not have running water. And that number is even higher on the Hopi Reservation, where nearly two thirds of the people live in homes without running water. But this morning, one group is finding a way around that. And we thought, you know, it was just the flu. But what B. Norton and her entire family got sick with was more than the flu and not everyone would survive it. That was always her wish was to die at home. And that at least, you know, she was with me when she finally passed. B's mom, Treva, losing her battle with the coronavirus back in April. One of the first people to die of COVID-19 here on the Hopi Reservation in Northern Arizona. It's a lot of guilt. My family and I have gone through, you know, that emotional part of it, just trying to figure out how could she have contracted it. One of the reasons why doctors say COVID-19 spread so rapidly on the Navajo Nation and here on the Hopi Reservation is that so many people don't have access to running water inside their homes. So so in this village, for instance, 35 families live here. None of those families have running water. The family used the water several times over before we pour it out, you know, and so sometimes even, you know, to the point that maybe we don't really often wash our hands. But today, all of that changes for the first time ever. B and her family have a working sink. It feels good. And B isn't the only one. More than 100 families across the Navajo and Hopi reservations now have access to something so many of us take for granted. And we knew that there, there was demand for it. Joe Seidenberg is the executive director of Red Feather, a nonprofit that helps make life in Arizona's tribal communities safer and more sustainable. We were just trying to figure out how we could quickly provide a response that would help keep people safe and provide increased sanitation. His solution? These hand washing stations made from two trash cans. With a few stomps on the foot pedal, water gets pumped through these plastic pipes and then starts trickling from the faucet. Hope flowing out with every drop. Yeah. Every time you walk by it, you're reminded of the fact that Washing your hands is a good thing and can help stop the spread of COVID. And the best part is wastewater isn't actually wasted at all. You can connect a hose to the other trash can and redirect that water to plants or even a garden. For B and the other families in this village, it doesn't entirely solve the water crisis. They'll still need to drive to area wells to fill up storage containers, but it brings them one step closer to the goal of eventually having running water. It's going to really help. Do you think that these hand washing stations are saving lives? Encouraging good hygiene, hand hygiene, surely is playing a part in creating healthier families um, and saving lives as well. For B, nothing can bring back her mom, but she's hopeful that these donated sinks will make hand washing a little easier and maybe spare another family from the same pain her family is still trying to heal from. It's an emotional journey at this point trying to deal with her passing. I miss her a lot. Yeah, and I just have to say B and her entire family are so strong and resilient. So B, thank you for sharing your story with us. I'm told one of the reasons why so many people don't have running water on the Hopi reservation is the process of installing pipes. Some tribal elders don't want their land dug up for religious and spiritual reasons. If you'd like to help and donate to Red Feather and maybe get more of these hand washing stations out there, head to abc15.com right now and look for this story on our homepage.